fresh every Tuesday for MSPs around the world. Around the world. This This is Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. We've hit a big milestone this week. Welcome to episode 150 of the podcast. Here's what we've got coming up for you this week. Hi, I'm Stuart Holtby. We'll be talking about how you can take your BCIO practice up a notch and make more money. That's my guest, Stuart Holtby, and he's here to talk about VCIO, Virtual Chief Information Officer. It should be or could be a revenue and profit stream in every MSP. We're going to be talking about that later on in the show. I've also got an idea for you to help your staff. It's a way of helping them with the cost of living crisis that we're going through right now, but it's also a way of showing to them that you really care. It's a simple idea, won't cost you a huge amount of money. I'll reveal it to you later on in the podcast. Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Last week on the show, I introduced you to three very clever weapons of influence. And they come from a book called Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini, a psychology professor who focuses on marketing. Now, I've got three more of those weapons to tell you about this week. So last week, we looked at social proof, reciprocity, and commitment and consistency. And the first we're looking at today is liking. If someone likes you, you will be in a better position to influence them. And just like last week, we were saying all of the the weapons of influence we were talking about were essentially core psychology. They talk to our core programming. So too does liking. Because our core programming that drives us today is the same programming that we had in caves 100,000 years ago. And of course, back then, we were in the middle of the food chain, so things ate us. There were also no police officers, so people would kill us. You know, you could meet someone while out walking down a country lane. If the dinosaurs don't eat you, some other kind of cave dweller can come up to you and smack you on the head with a club. And there's no consequence. There's absolutely zero consequence. So that's why we evolved the ability to instantly gauge whether or not we like someone or whether we are fearful of them. And we still have this today. When you meet people and you shake hands with them, you you do we do form an instant sort of a appreciation of whether whether or not this person is safe or not safe. We we call it gut feel, um, but it's actually the thing that's kept us alive. And of course because our ancestors back in cave days carry, you know, bread. And 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 it's weird to think that you've got family from 100,000 years ago that lived in caves. Anyway, you get the idea. So we, we're the evolution of that sense of, uh, uh, that sense of fear or that sense of acceptance, that emotional gut feel, because obviously we, we are the survivors. And that makes sense from an evolution point of view. So if you, someone likes you, particularly if they like you a lot, Uh, then you are much more likely to be able to influence them. Now, this is why in your marketing, you need to put you everywhere. And needs to, I need to see photos of you. I need to see videos of you. I need to learn more about your story and not your boring computer story. I first got an Amiga in 1982. Um, please do write to the usual address to tell me it came out in 1987 or whatever is the case. But I, I want to know about your real story. Why do you live in the city where you are? What is it about that city you love? Show me your other half. Show me your kids. Tell me what you do. You know, what, what are you involved in? What do you? How do you give back to the community? No one can get to like you if you're hiding behind a brand and a website and stock images. You've got to show people the real you. You know that when you go and sit down with a prospect and you talk about their business, they bond with you in some way. They're not picking your MSP, they're picking you. And they're doing that because they formed a relationship with you. They've realized they like you over uh, a couple of meetings. We can actually start doing that earlier on through our marketing. It's why, you know, we know that people buy from people. So show the people the people. It's as simple as that. Now, the next one that we've got is authority. So people in a position of authority are much more likely to influence. In the old days, this was why doctors, uh, medical doctors, wore white coats. Because if you had a white coat, you were an authority figure. It's why the police, it's why, uh, well, lots of people wear uniforms because uniforms set up a sense of authority uh, within us. Now, you can build authority as well. And the good news is, you don't need to wear a uniform, but what you do need to do is to act like an authority figure. Authority figures, Right. 
they create books, they write blog articles, they write on LinkedIn, they write LinkedIn newsletters, they record videos, they do podcasts, they do talks at things. Authority figures are content creators. You can put those two things together. And this has been the case for a hundred years or so. This is not just a new internet-y thing. It is simply the case that we perceive high quality content creators to be authority figures. In fact, it's one of the reasons why in my MSP Marketing Edge program, we give a series of resources to our members to help them catapult themselves into an authority figure position. So for example, we give them an IT services buyer's guide, which they can tailor to their MSP and pretend that they wrote it. We give them a book called Email Hijack, which again, they can put their name on the front. It shows that they are a published author. And we give them help doing presentations and talks, and of course, a load of video content as well. So we make it really easy to be an authority figure. People prefer buying from authority figures and are certainly more easily influenced by them. And then we've got the final one, uh, the final of Cialdini's six weapons of influence. And that final one is scarcity. When there is only a finite amount of something left, it forces us to make an opinion whether or not we want it. So restaurants will use this against us. They will say, for example, here's the menu, just a couple of things. This is out, this is out, and this, we're down to the last two of those because a good restaurant does run out of dishes. It, it proves that they're, they're not just taking them out of the freezer and microwaving them. And if you have a party of four and a waiter says, we're down to the last two of this dish, all of that party of four are instantly thinking, they, they've got to make a decision of, do I want that or not? And then there's that awkward standoff, isn't there, where three people in the party want to have it. And it's like, no, 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 you have it. I'll have the curry or whatever is the case. Now, how would you use scarcity in your MSP? Because the reality is you you have very little scarcity. It's like soft, software doesn't run out, does it? I know the number of licenses run out, but you just buy more licenses. And we've kind of had a bit of scarcity with hardware, with the supply chain disruption, but that's not a long-term thing. I prefer to deal in long-term stuff in the podcast because that stays relevant to you. Even if you're listening to this in the year 2032, welcome to you from the future if you're listening to this in 2032. If you are, could you email me if I'm not retired or dead or something? Uh, hello at paulgreensmspmarketing.com. It would just be really cool to hear from someone in the future. Anyway, uh, the scarcity, it's a, it's a hot summer evening as I'm recording this. I think the, 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 the weather's getting to my brain. Uh, the scarcity that you've got within your, uh, your MSP, the only scarcity is project time technician time. So I think scarcity can be leveraged when you're doing your strategic reviews with your existing clients and you're talking to them about their roadmap. We mentioned roadmaps last week in the podcast as well. Roadmaps are great because you get someone to sign it off. They're committing themselves to it. A, a technology roadmap can also be great for, for getting them to make a decision. Hey, look, you said you want to do this, this and this. That's going to be 80 hours of project time. We don't have that time now for, for you know, the, the earliest we can do it is three months time. Did you want to do it in three months or did you want to book it in for, let's say, you know, spring next year? And you can actually get people to make a commitment to, to uh, if you like, reserve the scarcity, the only scarce resource you've got, which is your project time. So please do go and have a look at this book, Influenced by Dr. Robert Cialdini. It's on Audible. It really is. It's a dry read, but it's a great read. And there are so many cool marketing and psychology things that you will learn from it. Here's this week's clever idea. Weirdly, considering it was how I made my living for the first few years of my adult career, I kind of try and avoid the news now. And I don't know about you, but I find the general news just to be very negative, especially at the moment. The cost of everything's going up, inflation's going up, interest rates, no one can afford to buy a loaf of bread. It's an absolute nightmare. And I, I just choose to insulate that myself from that. So I want to know what's going on, but I just don't want the, the general negativity pushing down on me. Maybe you're the same. I find a lot of business owners are very similar in this way. But of course, I am aware of the cost of living crisis. So certainly that's what we're calling it here in the UK. Wherever you are, maybe you're experiencing a similar thing. I know within the US, uh, there's a similar thing happening. So we were in the US just a few weeks ago and lots of talk of inflation and gas prices going up. And the reality is it is having an impact on ordinary people. The cost of living, just 
being around every day, it's costing more. And I, I, as a side note, I don't think this is something you should worry about for your business. Even as we go into recessions, I hate saying that recession word, but you know, there's a, recessions are cyclical. They come round. It doesn't really matter. You re, all a recession means is instead of the growth line being slightly up, the growth line is slightly down. It doesn't really mean anything. Yes, it's going to impact some of your clients. Yes, you may use a client. You may use some lose some users as, as some of your clients shrink down. I see recessions as opportunities because if you're fast and fun and you're full of energy and you're going for it and the kind of person that listens to a podcast like this is that kind of person, I think this is an opportunity. There's lots of old, slow MSPs out there that aren't changing. They're not, you know, reviewing what they do and adding new services and keeping up to date. You know, even in the six years that I've been in this world of MSPs in the channel, everything has changed and everything, is, well, it changes every, I think, seven to 10 years in our world. So I think if you're staying on top of stuff and you're proactively marketing and you're doing things, you honestly have nothing to worry about. If anything, you're going to take clients. You're going to win more new clients and you will come out of this recession better uh, and bigger than you were going in. And there are there are literally thousands of case studies of businesses that were built or grew hugely during bad economic times. It doesn't all have to be doom and gloom. But that's a side note. That's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the impact of the cost of living on your team. You see, as the business owner, you have the ability to take money out of the business anytime you need to. So long as there is money there, of course. But we do this as business owners. If there's money in the bank account, we can dip into that bank account and we can take some of that money out. And of course, the accountants and the bean counters have got to make it right somewhere. But we have access to cash. And we forget as business owners, certainly when you've been doing it for a while, and I've been doing this since 2005, which is a very long time, and you kind of forget what it's like to be on a fixed income, which is what probably the vast majority of your team are. There is an amount of money that they earn. And when that money is gone, they either have to borrow that money or they have to you know, find a way to earn some extra money. It's a fixed income. So for people on a fixed income, when the cost of living goes up, when petrol stroke gas prices are going up, you know, when, when energy prices in general, food prices, transport, when all of that goes up, even if it's just by a little bit, when you're on a fixed income, then obviously that has an impact. Now, you already probably give... Uh, pay rises to your staff and certainly on a regular basis that's something you should be doing because of the cost of living is going up but pay rises are expensive and I'm actually not a fan at all of just handing out pay rises willy-nilly the idea that everyone should get a three four five percent pay rise every year just because they'd stayed with you for another year I don't believe in that I believe that you give the best people uh, pay rises and, and, and you give them big generous pay rises on an irregular basis. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm not suggesting you give your team an extra pay rise. What I am suggesting is that you, if you choose to, make a one-off award, like give them a one-off payment to help them with the cost of living. Now, the reason you'd call it a one-off payment is you don't want them to think that this is something you're going to do on a regular basis. Because the problem with bonuses or pay rises, if they happen on a regular basis, is people come to expect them. If you give them a 3% three, 3 pay rise you know, every February, say, then every February comes around, people are expecting that pay rise. And you, I've seen MSPs get to a position where they're having to justify to their staff why they can't give them a pay rise this year. And because, you know, the business hasn't performed so well. It's crazy. It shouldn't be like that. So you could make a one-off payment to your team to help with the cost of or the, the rising cost of, of living. And that might be a few hundred pounds, uh, a few hundred dollars, wh whatever is comfortable to you. But really importantly, you you just give them that as a, as a one-off. And what, I mean, what you could do is you could time it carefully. For example, um, here in the UK, uh, we, we uh, our, our sort of gas and electricity prices have gone up 
quite dramatically uh, after years of them being sort of artificially uh, capped uh, by by the, the government or something something like that. Uh, but they've they've gone up and they're they're going up again uh, in in the in the, this fall this autumn and they're going to go up again in in the new year. And a lot of people are paying twice as much now uh, for their gas and electricity than they were paying before. So um, it would make sense if you're in the UK, for example, to time your your one off payment to the point at which those bills go up. And it's you that this is if we look at the, what this actually is. It's you saying to your staff, I understand. I understand that the cost of living has gone up and here is a one-off bit of money just to help you out. Now, if they choose to go and spend it on a PlayStation and not on electricity, that's their choice. That's nothing to do with you. The point is that you, that you are showing them, it's empathy. We talked about empathy, didn't we, a number of weeks ago in the podcast. You're empathizing with your team and their position. Now, if you are going to pay it, uh, let's say in two lumps, so lump in one month and lump a couple of months later, what you should do if you decide to do this is you should tell them about it now. So you might say to them, hey guys, I'm going to do a, a payment on uh, to help you with the cost of living. Uh, in two months' time, I'm going to give you this much. Two months after that, I'm going to give you uh, that much. Why would you tell them about that now? Because you get the benefits. In fact, you get three big benefits. You get the the wow factor of telling them. Let's hope they don't listen to this podcast, eh? The wow factor of, of you telling them and you showing that you're in tune. Uh, then you get the, the payment and then you get the, the, the second payment. So you get three sort of uh, emotional benefits from you making that payment. I, fa- I, I think you should do this with pay rises and bonuses as well. If you're going to give someone a bonus, tell them about it a month before they get the cash. So you get two impacts from it. If it's pay rises, in, announce it two months before. So you get the all of the, the emotional benefit and the and the desire to retain, the desire to stay, because obviously retention is is something we all have to think about right now uh, uh, because of how difficult it is to recruit technicians. So yeah, have a think about that. What what would be a reasonable amount of money? I, I don't know. I think that depends for you. Talking to some UK MSPs uh, a couple of weeks ago, we we said probably around about five hundred pounds, which is about six hundred dollars, maybe um, would would be a would be a, a generous um, thing. Obviously, split into two payments for cash flow. Depends how many staff you've got. Depends um, how much the cost of living has gone up. One of the MSPs I work with says all of his. Uh, technicians, they live they live with mom and dad. And so what's the point of giving them uh, uh, money to help with the electricity bills? Because it's never going to get to the electricity bill. They're going to spend it on beer and games. Uh, so I, I completely get that. So I think you, 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 you do it in your own situation. Just one final aside on this. If you are in the UK, there is also a tax benefit, which gives the benefit, I think it's around £6 a week. So all of your staff can fill in a form, and we'll, we'll put a link to this in the show notes. Uh, uh, all of your staff can fill in a form and uh, online uh, through the, the government gateway thing. And basically, they tell the government that they work from home on a, on a regular basis, which I'm sure they do. They do, don't they? They do. Yes, they do. So um, um, they will then get the equivalent of, I think it's like a tax benefit, but the, it'll save them the equivalent of £6 a week. Well, that adds up. Six pounds a week, six pounds a month. I can't remember. It's six pounds or something. It's free money. So it's free money for working from home. And uh, and they don't have to fill in a tax return, which is critical because ordinary employees hate filling in tax returns. We do it because we have to. Uh, most people will choose not to do it, but they literally just fill in a form and it adjusts their tax code thing. So we'll put a link to that in the UK. Uh, wherever you are in the world, it's perhaps worth having a look at your local tax laws just to see, is, is, there, a, is there any kind of work from home benefit or allowance or something? Or is there is there anything else? Can you help your team to claim that kind of allowance? Uh, certainly for that UK one, because it requires people sitting down, filling in a form. I would recommend if you're going to do that, you actually sit down with your team and do it. You could do it as like a team thing in, in, over lunch. It takes like 10 minutes to do, but you're kind of almost forcing them to do it to save them money at no cost to you, but they get a bit of extra benefit. Do go and have a look and see what local benefits there are available to you in your local area. The ultimate MSP podcast crossover. 
Just before we get to this week's big interview, I've got something a little bit different for you. September is such an important month for growing your business because people come back from their summer vacations, their holidays, and they kind of get their head down and plow on with doing as much as they can to grow their business throughout the next few months before we get to the Christmas break. Now, the ordinary business owners and managers that you want to reach, they're doing that right now, which makes it a great opportunity for you to reach out to them because this is the point they're starting to make their big plans and implement them. So I got together with a bunch of other great MSP podcasters around the world and together we are sharing our knowledge, our best ideas throughout September. Today it's Richard Tubb and Praveen Ramesh. Hey folks, this is Praveen from SuperOps.ai. I'm super excited to be part of this ultimate MSP podcast crossover event happening in September. And as part of this, I wanted to share the one piece of advice that I have followed being part of a startup and in my personal life as well. We grossly overestimate what we can do in the short term and highly underestimate what we can do in the long term. And when I say short term, it's like six months, one year. And when I say long term, it's five years, 10 years. Right. So it's these unsexy little things, the boring tasks done with deliberate practice and deliberate improvement over time that ensures that your results start compounding and leads to massive success. I think as humans and as businesses, we grossly underestimate the power of compounding. And once I realized that and someone gave me this advice, my life changed forever. The ultimate MSP podcast crossover. Hey, Richard Tubb here, the host of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. Now we're celebrating the ultimate MSP crossover event all through September. So here's the best piece of business advice I've ever been given. Don't try to do this alone. Running a managed service provider business can be a hugely rewarding endeavor, but it can be a lonely, tough slog. One way to mitigate this and accelerate your growth is to seek out like-minded individuals and communities. For instance, I'd highly recommend you attend a local peer group where you can speak to other MSP owners about your challenges and fast track your solutions. You can also get involved in communities like the Tech Tribe and CompTIA, where you'll soon realize that your fellow MSP owners can help you. You might also seek out mentors and coaches, people who have been there and done that. In short, don't try to do this on your own. You can grow your business a lot faster and have a lot more fun if you seek out people to surround yourself with for advice and encouragement. Now, I'll be back on our ultimate MSP crossover show on the 30th of September. And remember, you can win $1,000 by posting about our crossover on LinkedIn. Use the hashtag MSP podcast crossover to enter the draw. The big, big, big interview. So, hi, I'm Stuart Holtby and I'm from Get In Sync. Um, and I'm here to help uh, IT professionals get unstuck and get in sync. And what we mean by that, of course, is helping them to win lots more business, which we're going to talk about later on in the interview. Now, you are an MSP owner yourself, Stuart. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started and what kind of business are you running now? Yeah, you know, when I started, Paul, uh, we weren't really called an MSP. So I started in 1989. And yes, that's correct. Wow. 1989. That's before <laughs> cell phones and internet. So I uh, carried a pager and did all that. And we, we built our business on uh, the burgeoning, uh, of course, networking. That's how we began. Well, you know, back, some of your listeners will know Novell. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of gone by the dinosaur, but we used to be the Novell certified partner. And of course, then we, you know, back then it was really novel to connect two or more computers <laughs> and share a printer, right? So, and that's how we grew. So we grew to about 35 uh, employees uh, and uh, then moved into the dot-com space and everyone knows the history of that. And mm -hmm. so when we hit the dot-com, we shrank back down to a smaller size and that's where we are now. Okay. And what was the point that you shifted your business model away from the old fashioned break fix and more into managed services? Well, we started managed services, you know, sort of the mid, uh, like I said, 1995. They didn't really call it MSP back then. We called it virtual IT, you know, mm -hmm. so we were your virtual IT group and you could actually, you know, obviously contact us. And back then it was kind of a weird um 
you know, financial model because we used to do, uh, you used to have a bank of money with us and then you would draw from that. So it was kind of almost like a prepaid uh, service, but it was not really kind of geared as a monthly re recurring revenue. It was more along the line. So we knew that that wasn't, uh, that was a zero sum game because mm -hmm. we had to sit around for the phone to ring for us to make money and someone had to have a problem uh, for us to make money. So that's just a completely zero sum game. So that's when we started moving into that more, um, I guess what is now called, you know, managed services. And so we moved into that, at, you know, late nineties, but we also moved into the, uh, you know, the dot com business and started doing websites, web portals, and pretty much driven by customer need. Sure, and and today, would you say you you've got the the sta the standard? I'm going to put standard in speech marks, but the the standard managed services model. So monthly recurring revenue, and they they pay you a, a fee wh whether or not there's there's a, there's a problem. And of course, you're doing proactive work as well. Is that the model that you're up today? Well, actually, you know, it's interesting. Um, we've sort of moved away uh, from all of the actual speeds and feeds, wires and pliers, mm -hmm. and we really turned the business into what is I think referred to as a virtual CIO. We like to call it more uh, key account management or fractional CIO, whereby, you know, we more on the consulting side. So digital transformation, and we're really turning around IT teams and their organizations. So um, senior executives usually bring us in when their IT isn't working the way they want. And so we work closely with MSPs and, you know, we, help them get unstuck and get out of rut, show them sort of, you know, a fresh way of thinking and particularly leveraging that digital transformation to develop new business for their clients. Sure, sure. So we're going to talk about your platform Get In Sync in a little while. Let's let's first of all just go back and explore this VCIO. Now, I'm guilty of letting that phrase come out now and again in the podcast, you know, VCIO. Now, we all know what it, most of us know what it, what it means, Virtual Chief Information Officer. But it's one thing to understand what the acronym stands for, and it's another thing to actually understand what that means. Assume that I'm a seven-year-old. Teach me <laughs> what a VCIO is, as if, as if, t tell me as if I was a seven-year-old, Stuart. It's really designed to take um, a practical view of how technology can make a business more money. That's it in it in the nutshell. So what I mean by that is that instead of focusing on speeds and feeds, wires and pliers, let's talk about growing revenues. So the top line, let's talk about a shrinking expense. So the bottom line, or what's really in the news these days is reducing risk. You know, mm. so that's fortifying your your environment so you're protected against the bad guys. And I assume that, that you, because this is a more strategic thing, you're you're taking a higher level approach, and therefore you're you're charging a lot more, even though you're doing less stuff for the clients. Yeah, it's not. It's it's mostly uh, that strategic element whereby you're aligning the business's strategy. Uh, with the IT strategy. And so if the business, for example, um, let's just say, for example, one of their initiatives is to be more environmentally friendly. Mm. Well, that's sometimes lost on the traditional IT guys. They're like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, but then it does, because how can you be more environmentally friendly by providing um, unique technologies? Well, perhaps you can digitize all the paper in the organization. And if you're by digitizing all the paper, you're actually saving the environment. So there's a number of ways you can connect those initiatives that look a little fuzzy to the, you know, the historical or the traditional IT guy. And you can kind of relate it back to how you're going to, you know, push that or, you know, that thrust forward for the business. And what kind of business owner or what kind of management team really thrive with that kind of service? The IT leadership um, are looking for that coaching and, um, you know, that IT teams and IT managers really are looking for that uh, variety of pertinent topics that help that business succeed. And what I mean by that is that um, usually we get some tremendous success and people rave about our work from the way that we approach it in terms of our operating model. So what we look at is how can we leverage um, what you own already mm. uh, within your organization? So it's kind of those hidden IT assets. A lot of technology gets underutilized. So what we're trying to do is really turn on the technology you already have and um, you know, really make 
you know, make that resource, if you will, available to the business. Is that making sense? It, uh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So, so you have a, a platform called Get in Sync, which you supply to MSPs, and it allows MSPs. Well, t- tell me if I've got this correct. That your your platform allows MSPs to identify, uh, sell, and deliver these VCIO services. Have I got that right? Hundred percent. And so, what it does is it really provides that. Um, um, like we know, it's hard for IT professionals to really get that. Uh, client's business strategy. And because often it's, it's sort of, I don't know, fuzzy. <laughs> so there's a really uh, good saying, your strategy needs a strategy. But um, so what we do is we have this get in sync platform that's specifically designed for MSPs to help IT professionals really see their high level business opportunities and help their clients make that smart IT investment and grow their company. Um, you know, most MSPs turn to get in sync when they need to gain a clear line of sight uh, to the business drivers and um, really implement a, and craft a game-changing business IT strategy that delivers business innovation. So, you know, we often see the differentiators there are really um, MSPs are caught being more commoditized. And so this gives them a unique uh, differentiator so they can be more have more of a face because I think one of the biggest risks with MSPs is they're becoming, you know, that faceless vendor caught in the MSP, what I call commodity trap. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and people don't, the, the more of a commodity you become, the, the the less value people see in what you do, which is, which is quite ironic, really. So what was, obviously, you, you've gone from being a supplier to, 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 you know, to ordinary businesses to actually creating this platform to help MSPs. What was your aha moment, for want of a better phrase, the moment when you <laughs> realized, hang on, there's, there's, a, there's an issue here, there's a problem, and I could build something or create something to fix that problem? Well, um, you know, it was interesting because uh, in the rush to help our customers, we'd always get them what they asked for. Mm. But then we discovered it wasn't what they needed, and they were very frustrated with that. And so uh, we needed a way in which to understand their true needs and get their real requirements. And so the only way that we could do that is by putting in a decision management system, which is what Get in Sync is, to really take that frustration away. Often, you know, the old story, person gets off the aircraft with a magazine, you know, and says, get me one of them. Mm-hmm. Well, it's really not what you need, <laughs> but it's what you're asking for. Yeah. So, um, so it's really frustrating dealing with that. And the other aha moment was we were frustrated with um, giving away all the vi- the advice for free, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so I think what's unfortunate, uh, MSPs, there's gold all around their feet. They're just not picking it up. Because the um, other aha moment was uh, we got introduced to a strategic consultant from a very large um, chartered accounting firm. And he came in and the, our client introduced me as the IT guy. Well, he meet our IT guy. This is our new strategic consultant. So wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Why aren't you asking me? Because they didn't know. We did, they yeah. didn't know we did that kind of service. We could provide that kind of or perform those kind of functions. So, you know, again, we are faceless to the business. So that was the other aha moment. Yeah. So this is really about taking things that, that almost any MSP can do, the ability and knowledge and actually repackaging it in a way where it has a higher perceived value for the clients. That's right. And we have some MSPs that are charging, um, you know, like I always say to them, close the front door, close the back door, <laughs> service the MS, you know, service the clients you already have. And so we have um, you know, some MSPs that are charging 5000 a month for fractional CIO services. And the That's customers amazing. are delighted by the fact that they can hire um, and get a CIO for what it would normally cost them, you know, half the price. So they see it as a su- super discount. Yeah. And um, yeah, so those, and, you know, think of it, you know, fractional CIO or strategic account management is what we like to frame it as more so. Is that key account management is really what it's about. So sometimes the client doesn't even need to know you're being a fractional CIO to them. You know what I'm saying? What stops more MSPs from selling this high level consulting, this high level strategy work? Do you think it's confidence? It's that, but it's also, um, you know, I acknowledge that it's not, you know, for the faint of heart, um, you know, you're being called into the boardroom. They can, you know, can be, you're getting out of the server room and getting to the boardroom. It can be. 
but with the get in sync method and um, we 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 prepare you for all of that um, so we take you through a eight part framework um, you know we call it the eight eights where you advocate orchestrate uh, facilitate um, iterate <laughs> integrate it goes on but the point being is is that uh, we prepare you for all that so that you have you know uh, that confidence like you say it is a bit of a lack of confidence and you know we acknowledge it's not for the faint of heart like i say so um but we prepare you for all of that and really it's to get rid of the unhealthy perceptions of of msps what they have today because there's a um a lot of really really strong uh, people within these msps that we've come and we just it's a diamond in the rough you know so mm, yeah yeah i love that there's something you said earlier about there's plenty of gold at your feet you just got to go in and pick that gold up which i think yeah. is a is an epic phrase so tell us tell us a little bit more about the get in sync platform so is it is it a, a mixture of, of of training and support how exactly does it work well it's uh it's traditionally known in in i guess if you will in in the IT world as um, uh, portfolio management. Mm -hmm. So it's IT portfolio management, but it's more than that. Um, you know, it's an akin to um, QBRs, so quarterly business reviews. We um, take all of the information that we know about the client and we put it into the Get In Sync framework, into the platform, which it comes with an awesome SaaS tool and so forth. Um, and then what happens is that the uh, rich information starts to, um, if you will, bubble up into uh, the, you know, into this the dashboard and gives you that strategic capability to make really informed decisions. So what we're saying is the QBRs are sort of dead. It's an outdated um, approach because think of you know brushing your teeth every quarter and thinking you have good hygiene. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, what we're trying to say is that you need to be doing this in a real time. Um, you know, kind of a, having that real-time dashboard and information at your fingertips to be able to pivot with the business and understand what their, you know, real pain, pains are. What client are they trying to land? You know, what, what um, you know, revenue uh, are they trying to, you know, goals are they trying to meet? Mm -hmm. And then really tailor the, the IT investments to meet those challenges of your client. So, like I say, it really opens you up to the, and, endears you to the client because of course um you're talking their business yeah and the best way to sell well the best way to support someone or, or sell something to them is to to be in their shoes to understand what their priorities are their fears their their worries uh, and their needs so this is great stuff so Stuart, tell us uh, tell us what your website address is and what's the best way to get in touch with you yeah so uh the website is uh, getinsync.ca so um spelled exactly um, as it said. So, um, and you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. So, uh, you know, it's Stuart with a U, Stuart Holtby, H O L T B Y. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn and, you know, we can uh, get you plugged in and have that great conversation how you can make, um, you know, pick up that gold. <laughs> you know, like, um, and again, you know, the um, necessity is what the motherhood of invention. Did I say that correctly? So, yes, you know, this was the, this was exactly what we did. Um, after the dot com uh, blowout, um, you know, and we just tried to bring that enterprise thinking into mid size and smaller businesses, and uh, been you know very successful at getting you know like I say, folks really rave about it, and you get endeared to them um, because now, like I say, you're talking about their business. Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. This week's recommended book. Hi. This is Adam Wotton. My book recommendation is Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning. You win the morning, you're going to win the day and help more people. Coming up, Coming up next week. Hi everyone, George Smith here from Old Men. Join me and Paul for the podcast next week where an Irishman and an Englishman will talk about a Canadian company making waves across the globe with SaaS management. You don't want to miss it. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen so you never miss an episode. Because also coming up next week, we're going to be talking about cause-related marketing. It's essentially helping charities, but using the help that you're giving to charities or some other kind of organization, turning it into a marketing advantage for your MSP. We'll also be looking at the ham in the pan. And this is something which has come out of a great book I've been rereading recently called Traction. And it's about us doing things the way they've always been done 
and forgetting why we started to do those things in the first place. We'll explore that more next week. We have a ton of new content for you on YouTube. We're adding two to three new videos a week at youtube.com slash MSP Marketing. So please do check that out. And join me next Tuesday. Have a very profitable week in your MSP. Made in the UK. For MSPs around the world. Paul Green's MSP. MSP Marketing Podcast.